work backwards very precisely to where you're at. Build that plan, backward planning. A lot of people use the term backward planning. Build that thing backwards so that when you go forward, quality control checks, you'll be able to set up some, uh, which usually amounts to testing arrangements and validate where you're at. You know, it's measure twice, cut once. System design needs to change, you change it. But there is a number and most of us work to that. But the software people are like, you know, we can build a bridge without blueprints, destruct signal triggered to self-destruct circuitry. So basically a software variable overflow went and blew up the rocket. So so these things are very serious, very real. Involved, whose reputation and who's on the hook for a deliverable. And you got the engineering crew off having some sort of pretty sure the philosophical divide between the engineering world. All right, everybody. This will be about working with software teams. So software teams are their own animal. So you can have mechanical engineers, electrical engineers, aeronautical engineers, you know, you pick it. And by and large, they will have very disciplined processes, very much know what you're doing before you start doing stuff. Know exactly where your endpoints are, work backwards very precisely to where you're at. Build that plan, backward planning. A lot of people use the term backward planning. Build that thing backwards so that when you go forward, According to that plan, you'll get to where you're expected to be. You'll be able to monitor that on time. You'll be able to set up quality control checks. You'll be able to set up some, uh, which usually amounts to testing arrangements and validate where you're at. You know, it's uh, measure twice, cut once. And most engineering discipline is like that. Software is not. Software does not do that. Everyone's heard the, the uh, agile process moving forward. It's just a different mindset. It's more like, how fast can we generate code? We'll make small incremental steps on what we think we need to do and then fix it if it turns out not to be the correct thing. We're not going to follow a plan. We're going to follow 12 steps in the Agile process. So it's just a completely different way to look at things. The issue comes when you need to work with a software team and integrate all that software with whatever systems you might be working with. These are very complex things. They're not, they don't tolerate a lot of variability and messing around. Physics works a certain way and, you, and you're in that physical domain in almost every discipline except software because you can create software. Software people can do whatever they want to in software. It all seems possible. It's just not a, a highly structured thing. So, you know, the, some, some of the notes here on the software team mindset is, you know, the Agile Manifesto I mentioned that, well, I'll put some references in the bottom here so that you can go to that. I've looked at all those things. I'm not a software engineer, but uh, having worked with them enough and hearing all the rationale, kind of know where things are coming from. They value the autonomy and flexibility versus structured requirements. They kind of just don't want to hear about your requirements. Just really not interested. They kind of know what they got to be, where they're going to be at, or they feel they do. So they're just going to go do that. And I've even heard them say, well, I could give you a schedule. I could do that, or I could just write code. Which would you prefer? I'll do one or the other. So they get very territorial, very defensive. They just don't really want to integrate with anything that has structure or a discipline approach to it. Don't really need to document it. We're just building code and the code is the product and that's what we're delivering. So don't care about your documentation, whether someone can come along and get into it and see what happened while we were developing, how decisions were made, why that version of the code is different than a different version of the code. Not interested, don't care. It's just what it is. And then communication style is very informal. They change, I notice a couple of projects. It's very common for the software people to change words. Vocabulary does not stay the same. It's like for electrical engineering, you'll have a word like amplifier. Amplifier means something. It means there's an input, there's an output. There was a changes on a lot of stuff. Software's not like that. It's an amplifier one day, it's a capacitor the next day, it's it's a car the next day, you know, it's a spaceship the next day. Same exact thing. So vocabulary is all over the place. And I'm not really trying to criticize. I think they're worthy criticisms, but you gotta know what you're dealing with going into these things. Otherwise, you'll spend three months of your life trying to figure out what is wrong with the software team? Unless you are a software person, you don't know that what 
where their backgrounds, where they're coming from, what you're going to do, and all of us do until we learn better, is going in assuming that everyone's on the same page, everyone's trying to do the same thing, that we're all on the same team with the same goals, marching to the same outcomes. It's not true. It's just not. It's not what they do. So in order to make that bridge that gap, there's some techniques you can use to, to help bridge that. And uh, there's a lot of examples of software really really you know poorly done software just really creating problems i'm trying to present the i won't say extreme case but i'll say more than likely typical case there are some good software teams who do care about whether or not they're building to the right stuff but on average not so much like in a system engineering culture or most engineering cultures we're going to value precision over this flexibility it's 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 just it has to perform to a certain number or it's wrong. It doesn't mean you can't change the number. It doesn't mean you're not flexible that way. If the system design needs to change, you change it. But there is a number and most of us work to that. But the software people are like, you know, we can build a bridge without blueprints and we can do aircraft software with a without a lot of testing. You might recall Boeing being in the news for some of that, all software problems, according to the news, what gets released. Lots of disasters to quote from the Mars Climate Orbiter. This is a while ago. So the designers designed that orbiter in assuming metrics, metric numbers, right? Kilometers, Newtons, etc. And the software guys did it all in SAE. Inches, feet, miles, pounds, not kilograms. So that thing got to Mars and Died. Another example here was at the Denver airport, the luggage luggage system. So totally automated, right? Denver airport, if you've ever been there, there's just miles of it. And I think it was over 10 miles of, of conveyor belts. So the software guys wrote what they needed to, to get the conveyor belts to run, to the doors, to, you know, the, the, the gates to flip back and forth. So those individual pieces they wrote and got to work with some level of testing, but they were so confident that they didn't go for the full testing, like put a bag at terminal A4 and see if it gets to C12, whatever. They turned it on, they went live with that, just had to scrap the whole thing and start over. But that was an extreme case of software people just being allowed to run the program and do whatever they felt was correct. And there's articles, again, I have these articles linked at the bottom here by the time I'm done, by the time you see this. And uh, it, total disaster, lots of money spent. Then in the 90s, pick kind of dated ones because I don't want to pick things that are real current because there's maybe still litigation going on or all this stuff. So, but the ideas are exactly the same. It's exactly the same. So they're valid. To my mind, they're valid. So there was this Arian uh, rocket that uh, NASA was working through, and there was an Arian 4 that had worked fine. Uh, lots of work went into that, and it was got into orbit, did everything it was supposed to do. And so there was some improvements made for a different version called Arian 5. After everything's all done, after the, the thing bl basically blew up on its way up, Arian 5 did, and $370 million in losses. I'm sure it was more than that. That, but that's what the maybe the rocket itself was. Turns out that the software guys had a computation going on, doing some calculations in their software, had a had an overflow of that variable, and that overflow went and created a self-destruct signal, triggered the self-destruct circuitry. So basically a software variable overflow went and blew up the rocket. So so these things are very serious, very real. And so the idea that you just, you know, let it go, don't document. Don't look at the requirements, don't look at the plan, don't do the required amount of testing uh, is just extremely inconsistent with how engineering works. A niche by itself, and maybe if you're just staying in the software world and you're not really touching anything else, and maybe you're just making an app that does or doesn't work, just struggling for an example that's small enough in consequence and scope that this makes sense, then turn it out as fast as you can. You know, turn out that new app upgrade every six weeks, stay ahead of the competition. Wow, it's great. But if you're doing highly integrated products or projects across multiple disciplines, you've got to sync those things together. All that has to be synced up. You just can't have that cowboy loose cannon thing happening. That's been my experience. And I think it's one of the more difficult alignment problems, you know, system engineering, as we talked about an episode ago or so, is all about alignment 
it's all about things meshing together, supporting the whole, supporting how the you know system actually functions in the end, right? Hardware guys depend on software ICD and depend on make certain assumptions about what's going on in the processing, for instance, or message formatting or unit conversions or whatever it is. So the hardware guys sort of depend on spec out and depend on that to be true. Now you bring in software guys who are freewheeling and the faster they go, the, the more they're rewarded. There's a mismatch there. So some of the key things on doing that, well, the mismatch and then, you know, it's just different value systems, you know, speed and adaptability for the software people and hardware people are more like safety, reliability, and precision. That's, that's where we live. And that's not consistent with the value system that software people have. So when you get these two groups together and anybody that's been doing this for a while is gonna know exactly what we're talking about here. When you get these two groups together, there's, there's a problem. There's a problem from day one and you got to address it on day one. And really what it comes to is how you accomplish that alignment. One of the things you have to do is you have to get the team organized as a team. Uh, there was some literature that talked about, if you show me your communication style, I'll show you the quality of the product you're gonna put out. That will be referenced in the bottom too. So depending on how, if you allow the software people to just be by themselves, do their dolphin speak and just run wild with products, you're gonna have a problem. That's the million monkey typing war and peace kind of reference, if you know what that, if you recall that, we'll eventually do war and peace. So really it's about how to integrate the team together. You know, how do all the components of the team, are they talking regularly? Are they getting along? Are they just spiteful to each other? Does the system guy say, here's the requirements you gotta hit, you're not hitting them. I can see it by the testing we're doing. So what's your plan? And well, we don't need a plan. We just need to write a new patch. Okay, so when does that close on the schedule? And how many people are we even staffed correctly to do that? So if the team is communicating well, not undermining each other, there's there's lots to poke fun at here. There's, just, there's, there's no end to this. There's no end to this humor you can get out of this. But the bottom line is it's not funny at all. This is somebody's money. There's a company or a government office in, involved whose reputation and who's on the hook for a deliverable and you got the engineering crew off having some sort of pretty sure the philosophical divide between the engineering world and software is not something someone's willing to pay for that's supposed to be integrated and laying flat so that needs to be done and uh, really it's all about coexisting it's all about understanding what you're dealing with you know mechanical and electrical people are not the same chemists are not the same as electrical or mechanical. God forbid you have to work with a physicist because for a physicist, all engineers are hacks. We're just making approximations on stuff and making it work. So, so everyone's different, but software is very special different. You really have, to, you need to really pay attention to what kind of team you're getting, what kind of leadership you're getting because the software leader is the key to the software team running wild. If they're able to say things like, let's get rid of system engineering because we have an architecture, we'll have more on that later, not in this video, but another one. If they're able to pull that kind of stuff, your, your probability of a cost overrun, schedule overrun, or just a failure goes through the roof. So in companies, I think that's easier to manage because there's a profit motive. At some point, the business leaders or sometimes even the business development guys will look at the project progress and go, what, what is going on? Why is this like this? And then they can drop the hammer on bonuses, they can drop the hammer on paychecks and promotions, or just outright fire people, just get rid of them. Government's not so easy, very little accountability in the government. I was in the government for a while, seen the government function. Some of them are very good. You know, some of them could leave the government and go to industry and be just fine. Other ones, not so much. So if there's no accountability, and the way that affects industry is there's no accountability on the government side, then the, what the government's willing to pay for in terms of organization of the project may be such that you cannot get organized the way you need to be. So it's not just negotiating the communication and the alignment on a company side, it's also making sure that your customer, whether it's another company or government, if they don't understand it, at least be supportive of it and understand that you understand it. And there's lots of, there's tons of examples. Like I say, I'll, I'll post some things here in, in the chat, not in the chat, too many Teams meetings. Uh, I'll post it here in the video, in the comments. But so there's a lot, lot, lot good down this road. There's, there's a lot of finger pointing back and forth. You just don't want that to get out of hand. 
if that gets out of hand, you got problems. And it doesn't matter who gets the best gotcha phrase, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who convinces what boss to do what. It doesn't matter. If that stuff's going on and you can't work as a minimum, there's going to be some minimum team size depending on what the project is and the level of integration. If you can't achieve that minimum, it just it's just not going to work. You won't deliver. You won't make the profit. You won't hit the time scales. Nothing. Nothing. Will, it just breaks. And someone may feel like, well, you know, we did it the right way. We got rid of those other people and the software people ruled. Okay, great. You won. Now what? So let's have some fun with this one. I think we'll revisit this. I think maybe we'll have some comments and come back to this. One. We've got some more coming up and uh, in the hopper here. And we already got the intro out. So you got to see where the good trails are around where I'm at. And so we'll cut this one off and look forward to the next one. Hope you enjoy the, the series here. Let me say we've got a podcast coming up too. So we're looking forward to that. And it might be on this topic. Okay, bye.